Thank you all for coming today. I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little about the subject of aquatic invasive species and more specifically to talk about the system of rivers and waterways that invasive carp currently inhabit and how our historical relationship with these rivers influences our understanding of the problem and constrains our thinking about solutions. What I hope to impart today is that we need to see the carp problem not simply as the movement of some unwanted species of fish, but as a function of widespread systemic problems. I'm gonna present some of what I've learned in more than 10 years of working on the carp problem. I enjoy telling this story. Of all the issues I've worked on, I think this is probably the most interesting to me. I love its connections to the history of Chicago. It touches on incredible achievements of engineering and the will to master nature, but not coincidentally, it also implicates questionable decisions and some of the more poorly functioning aspects of our society. It's also a story that, in my opinion, offers a glimpse at how and why we must radically rethink our relationship to water, to our rivers. So let me give you my thesis up front, and then I'll work back through some of the details. So here's the setting. There are invasive carp working their way up the Illinois and Mississippi rivers and threatening to enter the Great Lakes. The Army Corps has proposed a large and expensive project to be installed at the Brandon Road Lock and Dam in Joliet, Illinois. This project is intended to stop carp from getting any closer to the lakes. Now, my point today is not to say that we shouldn't spend money on projects to stop invasive carp, maybe even a lot of money. And it's not to say that we shouldn't build this project. However, this project is estimated to cost more than $850 million. Projects that approach the billion dollar price tag should be carefully considered. A billion dollar project is an investment. And with resources being scarce and so many different problems piling up, we should ask what exactly this is an investment in. Well, Brandon Road is, among other things, an investment in stopping invasive carp from spreading into the Great Lakes. Now, it's actually the other things that Brandon Road is an investment in that I want to focus on, but it's good to start with the thing that it is most represented to be, a way to stop carp. Why do we want to stop carp? I don't want to spend too much time talking about how bad carp are, but suffice it to say, invasive carp can do serious damage to environments and the economies that depend on those environments functioning well, or at least functioning in a predictable routine manner. So carp could upend the ecology of the lakes, as well as all the amazing tributaries that feed the lakes. There are fabulous, beautiful streams, creeks, and rivers all over the Great Lakes region that feed into the lakes. And in some respects, these areas would probably fare worse from carp than the lakes themselves. And there are important economies that depend on these areas, commercial fishing, recreation, tourism. So it's good not to introduce invasive species and and wreck all of this. And for years now, interest groups and stakeholders have pushed to keep carp out of the Great Lakes and federal processes unfolded. And eventually the Army Corps of Engineers was asked by Congress to develop solutions to the transfer of invasive species through the Chicago area waterway system. Let me highlight that again. Their task was to stop the two-way transfer of aquatic invasive species through the system. But this process was always driven almost exclusively by concern over invasive carp. And eventually when the Army Corps produced a solution, this was a solution very much to the problem of carp and not other invasive species. And even in terms of stopping carp, it's not even entirely a solution for that. I would describe Brandon Road more as a solution to allow industrial shipping of products like corn, soybeans, chemicals, and fossil fuels to continue while achieving some amount of risk reduction against invasive carp. And that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes this afternoon. The barge industry and its various attendant industries, so ag, chemicals, fossil fuels, these industries work in coordination with what essentially amounts to a sponsor and partner within the federal government the Army Corps of Engineers. And this multi-headed public-private entity is really what sets the policy agenda for our great rivers at the expense of the public and at the expense of what rivers can and should be, settings for a full, vibrant community of life that treats the river as a source of that life. But we have allowed our rivers to be turned into barge highways and open air sewers, and we continue to allow this. Okay, so, Let me back up. The very first thing I was hired to do when I began working for Prairie Rivers Network 
was to advocate for a solution to the transfer of aquatic invasive species through the Chicago area waterway system. I say invasive species, but the focus was at the time and remains on a couple species of carp that are in the Mississippi and Illinois rivers, but not yet in the Great Lakes. The Chicago area waterway system or cause serves as an artificial connection between the Great Lakes and Mississippi River watersheds. The first thing is to understand how this system makes that connection and why. So let me back up even more. Here's the cause here in these maps. Now, prior to around 1900, give or take, the Chicago River and the Calumet Rivers flowed into Lake Michigan. Right around 1900, the flow of the rivers was reversed and a canal was built so that water flowed out of Lake Michigan into the Chicago River and then through those man-made canals into the Des Plaines River, which eventually connects to the Illinois and Mississippi River. This was done for a couple of reasons. The primary reason was that the growing city of Chicago was sending all its waste right back into its water source, Lake Michigan. There was not really any water treatment at the time, so this was a recipe for illness and death. This reversal of the rivers and this artificial connection meant that Chicago could send waste, human waste, industrial waste, runoff, stockyard waste, away from its water supply and make it someone else's problem. They didn't have to deal with it. They didn't have to pay for it. Also, the secondary reason was that trade could then move on the water between the inland waterways and the rivers and the eastern seaboard via the Great Lakes. <clears throat> so much of the wealth that was extracted from the land by European settlers of the American West was routed through Chicago on its way back to the population centers of the East Coast. This is the commerce that in fact helped build Chicago. So you can see those dual purposes right there in the name, Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal. There were, different con there were many different consequences of this connection, but one that people didn't start thinking about until relatively recently was that this connection allowed aquatic invasive species to move between the Great Lakes and Mississippi watersheds. They hadn't been connected before, suddenly they were. The most famous of these species at the moment are invasive carp. Now there's a whole other presentation on how invasive carp got here, but the short version is that they were imported into the US in the middle of the 20th century. Um, it, you know, really the intent to clean up aquaculture ponds, so aquaculture farm ponds. They're really voracious filter feeders, um, so it was hoped that they could battle the algae and the muck that quickly accrues when you're farming lots of fish in a small area of water. One way or another, they ended up, uh, they escaped and they ended up in the Mississippi River, and from there they basically made their way into most of the river systems, big and small, connected to the Mississippi. Starting around the 1990s, some people really first took notice of this and thought, you know, these fish are going to get into the Great Lakes, we don't do anything about it, and that could be bad. Bad for native fish and bad for non-native fish that are considered desirable. Bad for economies and, and cultures that rely on those fish. So, in 2002, an electric barrier was installed in the Sanitary and Ship Canal. You can see it right here, just kind of upstream of Lockport. Electrodes were put into the canal to create an electric field in the water. The barrier was actually built to stop a different invasive species, the round goby, but it was completed too late and the goby had already moved between the two great watersheds. So it has ended up being a carp barrier. At this moment, the electric barrier is the primary means of structural deterrence against invasive carp migrating into Lake Michigan. So this is what the system looks like now. All right, you've got your Sanitary and ship canal, you've got the CalSag canal, the water comes in from the lake, it goes downstream. Got a system of locks and dams up and down the Des Plaines and Illinois River, and here's your electric barrier. Now, a lot of the stakeholders who want to keep carp out of the Great Lakes didn't think the electric barrier provided enough protection. So, um, and the studies really kind of backed that up. Um, so in the last decade or two, there's been a lot of interest in finding a solution to keep invasive carp out of the lakes. 10 years ago, one of the solutions being discussed was severing the connection. So severing the artificial connection, um, or as some put it, restoring the natural divide. This was the preferred solution of many environmental groups working on this problem. I was actually hired by Prairie Rivers Network to advocate for that solution. 
Um, now, there were, there were years of negotiations between various stakeholders, environmental groups, the city of Chicago, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, uh, shipping interests and the various industries that ship their products on the waterways, chemicals, petroleum, ag. In that time, it became clear that re-separating the basins was going to be very expensive and it faced considerable political headwinds. Those headwinds derived primarily from opposition on the part of stakeholder groups that have always benefited from the canal system. So the city of Chicago, which still uses the canal to send its waste downstream and the shipping industry. I'm gonna use the term shipping industry as shorthand, but when I do, again, I want you to understand that I also mean to include the chemical, petroleum, ag industries, among others. Um, now, at the behest of Congress, a major study was conducted by the Army Corps of Engineers, the federal agency in charge of operation of the waterways. And that study looked at various alternative solutions to prevent the transfer of aquatic invasive species between the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes watersheds. The plan that was settled on was to reinforce the Brandon Road Lock and Dam at Joliet, Illinois, with various deterrent technologies. Here's what Brandon looks like and how it works. This is the Des Plaines River at Joliet, Illinois. There's a high head dam here, and there's a lock over here. Uh, the lock system allows vessels to move up and down the system. The lock was identified by the Army Corps as a potential control point for invasive species moving upstream. Anything coming downstream, anything coming downstream this way from the lakes just goes right over the dam and just follow the river's flow right over the dam and on downstream. So I'll, coming back, I'll come back to that in a minute, but anything coming upstream has to go through the lock. Whether you're a ship, a fish, or an invertebrate trying to make your way upstream, you have to move through the lock. So the Corps came up with a plan to deploy various technological deterrents at the lock, the primary deterrent being a new electric barrier at the entrance to the lock. The plan is currently estimated to cost $858 million and will take about a decade to design and construct. That's best case scenario, a decade. It's a very complicated project, so it's definitely within the realm of possibility that it takes longer than that. There are various elements of the project, um, electric barrier, flushing lock, um, uh, a sound, sound barrier. Um, experts have offered various opinions on just how much risk reduction the Brandon Road project will provide. The barrier will provide the greatest deterrent, but research has shown that electric barriers are vulnerable, particularly to small fish and to schools of fish, and that barges can pull fish through in their wake, through the electric barrier. The electric, bar the electric barrier will also be shut off when ships move through it. So it'll be shut off right at the moment of greatest risk of carp moving upstream. Now, there are other technologies that will supplement the electric barrier. Uh, the lock will flush water out of it, and they're going to install speakers that will play sounds that carp apparently find unappealing. <laughs> so it's a system of different technologies that, in theory, reduces the risk of carp moving through the lock. Um, the experts that looked at this largely agreed that it would pr provide risk reduction, but um, that some amount of risk does remain. So something I kind of alluded to earlier, there are more invasives than just carp. In fact, there are many more invasives that are not moving toward the Great Lakes. Most of the invasive species that we're aware of are actually in the Great Lakes. And if they move, they would be moving into the Mississippi River system. Here's a list. So we got three over here, silver carp, big head carp. There's actually a, a third carp called grass carp that's uh, possible. And then we've got 10 over here. And these were all, um, there, are, there are actually more than this, but these were the ones that the Army Corps identified as, as being of, of a higher risk. And actually, um, some of the species that the Corps identified as being, there are a couple of species that the Corps identified as being a greater threat than carp in terms of potential damage to environments and economies. And in fact, those species are in the Great Lakes going the other way. The project at Brandon Road will have no impact on any of these species in this column. Because like I said, those species will just go right over the dam at Brandon Road. So this is very much a one-way solution. There was another option identified by the Corps. There, was a, there were several options, but there was one other that I want to mention. This option brought the risk of cart movement down to zero. And rather than costing the public 850 million, it would cost 6 million. And it could be done almost immediately. That option was to permanently close the lock. No ships and thus no water would be able to move upstream. Now, 
that option was rejected immediately. Environmental NGOs who just a year or two prior had been calling for a $25 billion project, complete separation of the basins, didn't really bother pressing the issue. A decision had been made or perhaps marching orders had come in. The, technical, the technological option at Brandon was the one that would be moving forward. So this is the point where I'd like to ask why? Why these fish in particular? Why not those other invasive species? Why is the solution here at Brandon Road in Joliet? Why in the Des Plaines River, not the canal? You know, the Des Plaines River is a natural river. It's not the waterway that artificially connects the two basins. It's not the Cal Sag. It's not the sanitary and, and ship canal. So why here? And why a one-way solution? And I want to use the remainder of my time to answer that and unpack those questions a little bit. What are rivers for? So I, I like to drive along Interstate 55 cross over the Des Plaines River and over the Des Plaines River Valley. You don't have to squint too hard to see how this could be a magnificent area for humans and nature to interact in a happier, healthier way than we often do. There's a relative abundance of green space. You know, we've, we've paved and planted so much of Illinois. I look at the Des Plaines and I see a little bit of what could be a wildlife corridor, a place for recreation, scenic vistas, but other elements intrude on the vistas along the Des Plaines. You see barges moving chemicals along the river. You see the sprawling steel city of the Exxon refinery lit up at night like some otherworldly outpost, spewing flames and God knows what into the air. It's morbidly beautiful in its own way. I, I meant it when I said that I do like driving by there. It's like dystopia is compelling. The apocalypse is fascinating. This is the area. It is a sacrifice zone. We have ceded use and control of our great rivers to polluting climate wrecking industries. For over a century, we have sent wastes downstream. Chicago has made its waste problem Joliet's problem, Peoria's problem, St. Louis's problem, Memphis's problem, eventually New Orleans problem. The rivers have been so mismanaged, manhandled, polluted and degraded, who is left to speak for the rivers? What constituency is there for the rivers? By and large, the constituency is the very industries using and abusing the rivers. This here reveals a dramatic and critical difference between the inland waterways and the Great Lakes. There are people, businesses, industries, indigenous nations for whom the lakes being protected is important and good. There are stakeholders who want to protect the lakes from invasive species. That's why there's attention on carp. And a lot of these stakeholders have money and can spend money to fund nonprofits, to advocate and lobby and do media to protect what's theirs. The lakes aren't pristine by any stretch, but they are worlds apart compared to our rivers. They are considered the crown jewels of the region. The people who fund nonprofits have nice big homes on their shores. There's a, there's a desire to protect those jewels. Do we consider the rivers jewels? I don't believe so. I don't think they're considered that because we have spent a century plus degrading them. Rivers are more than water flows. Rivers, along with their floodplains, are communities of life, but we've turned them into open sewers and channelized barge highways. Our rivers do not have the same constituency as the Great Lakes. So why are we putting this carp solution here? Why are environmentalists and environmental groups advocating for this solution in this location? because all the lofty rhetoric about protecting places, protecting communities, we are doubling down on a paradigm of the sacrifice zone. And at the, end of, at the end of the day, this is my biggest issue with Brandon Road. It's not an invasive species solution. It's not even really the best solution to stop invasive carp. This is a solution designed to accommodate the status quo while achieving at unbelievably high cost some difficult to quantify amount of additional protection against invasive carp. I said at the beginning that we should scrutinize a billion dollar investment. What is it an investment in? This is a billion dollar investment in that status quo. How valuable is the status quo to the principal players who profit from it? Well, again, we settled on a project that will cost the public, you and me, 850 million at least, and it'll take a decade plus, rather than something that costs six million and could be done tomorrow. Now, that's 
a little bit one-sided. I recognize that. And perhaps you weigh all of that against the cost of letting carp into the Great Lakes, and it still looks good by comparison. I can't really blame anyone who comes to that conclusion. But again, it's not a binary of Brandon Road or nothing. What were the other options? Well, closing the lock was one, a cheaper, more effective one. Restoring the natural divide was another. But either of those options require fundamental shifts in the way we do business. Closing the lock means the end of shipping pet coke on the river, the end of letting Exxon set river policy. Restoring the natural divide means Chicago's wastewater has to go to Lake Michigan. Chicago has to deal with its waste problem rather than sending it to the Gulf. And fundamental shifts in the way we do business are hard political cells. So I totally understand why someone would say Brandon Road was the only thing that was polit politically feasible. But that dynamic right there is exactly what has to change or we will fail to solve any of the most serious environmental crises that we face. We cannot just surrender in advance. This is a story that implicates so many different pieces of infrastructure, governance, biology. But at its heart, I think there is one thread that runs through it. This is a story of sacrifice zones, of forcing other people to pay the costs, a story of private interests taking precedence over the public. Even as these private interests are massively subsidized by the public to run their operations, we, the public, overwhelmingly pay to run the waterways, but they profit and they set the policy. My problem with Brandon Road is that at the first chance of gaining some security for one corner of the world at the expense of someone else, that chance was leapt at. I threw this up there just because I love this headline when I was pulling some photos of the Exxon refinery. Flare smoke from Juliet refinery, nothing to worry about, says Exxon. I think that sums up a lot. I'm sure it was nothing to worry about. So this is a photo of the Chicago River, downtown Chicago along the Riverwalk. This is apparently rust and dirt uh, that for some reason started spilling into the river a few years ago. But I would ask you to imagine it as any pollutant. It could be sewage, it could be industrial pollution. The regime that's still in place is that it's easier and cheaper to send that downstream than to deal with it. Here's the entire Mississippi River watershed. At the bottom in the Gulf of Mexico, that yellow and blue area, that's the dead zone caused by nutrient pollution and algal blooms. This is a map of nitrogen and phosphorus pollution that feeds the dead zone. The green represents ag runoff. The red areas represent urban pollution. You, you'll notice that Chicago is the single largest urban contributor to the Gulf dead zone. And all that nitrogen flooding into the Mississippi River from the crops planted right up to the bank of every stream and creek in the Midwest. Illinois is a major contributor to the dead zone. This is all a function of using the Mississippi River as a sewer. All these problems, carp, pollution, nutrients, ag, <laughs> we've all, we defined all of them too narrowly. We have to start looking at the entirety of the system. And this system stretches from the Atlantic Ocean to Chicago via the Great Lakes, and then through the cause, it stretches to the Gulf of Mexico. There are a couple ways you can approach environmental advocacy. I think the default too often has been to ask, how can we protect this place that we view as ours, as within our jurisdiction? But I would challenge environmental funders, organizations, and activists doing this work to ask another question. Are we doing harm to someone else? And if so, should we remedy that? To close, I want to challenge all of us to speak up for our rivers, to be advocates for our rivers, to be champions for our rivers. No one else is going to. The cavalry is not coming, not unless we are the cavalry. We have to build a constituency for something that has been badly degraded, that is practically lost. That is a difficult task. It's going to take time and dedication. But we're, what we're working for is something beautiful, something of incalculable value. The river as more than water flow, more than barge highway, more than pipeline for climate wrecking fossil fuels. The river as community of life. Prairie Rivers Network is committed to that work. I hope you'll join us. Thank you. And with that, I'm done. And if there's any time for Q&A. Yes. Um, 
Thanks, Robert. And if you have uh, haven't yet, which we have one question at this point, so if you would please add your uh, questions to the to the chat, and then we can get to them. And uh, Robert, the first one is, says, uh, "What is the economic impact of closing the dam?" Closing the lock, right? Uh, that's probably what they mean. Yeah, probably closing. Yeah, the lock. yeah. And so I do want to be clear that you know it, it's a it's a public cost of six million dollars. Obviously there would be um, a chain of economic costs and they started to look at, it's still um, paled in kind of comparison to what the, you know, the overall public cost of the Brandon Road Lock and Dam. Now it's, it's, it could have effects on the prices, the prices of various commodities, um, chemicals, you know, corn, like it's, if it's going to cost people more to move those products, those prob products are probably going to rise in, in cost. Um, but again, I would say the, you know, so I, I don't have the exact answer, like how much annually are, are prices going to rise? Uh, you know, I, the core kind of looked at some of those numbers, but, um, you know, I think to me, the, the, the question would be, are we letting markets work at all? And I would say, no, we're not, you know, we're, we, the, the, the inland waterway system is the most heavily subsidized form of transportation outside of trips to the International Space Station. Like we pay like 97% of the cost for them to do business. And, um, you know, can these industries um, operate <laughs> without damaging the rivers? If they can, great, you know, that's fine. But, you know, I think we've got to be in a place where they're internalizing those costs. They can't just continue to externalize those costs and make the public bear the brunt. So, um, you know, that's my um, slight detour to your question. Thank you for that question, though. Um, Leslie asks, are the shipping industries the main barrier to closing the lock, or is water quality into the lake a cost? Is overflow an issue? Good, good question. So because um, shipping is the primary obstacle to closing the lock, um, because if you close the lock, you've still got the river flowing south. So um, Chicago would still be able to send Chicago and MWRD who kind of rely on using the rivers as an outlet would still be able to send their water downstream. Just like I said, the invasive species, you know, going, um, downbound would go over the dam. Well, so does the water. So now that piece of it, like Chicago's wastewater, that doesn't get implicated until you basically truly sever the connection, you know, so if you walled off the, you know, filled in the canal, for example, and walled it off. Well, now Chicago can't send its water. You know, I, I guess it could pipe it. It could build another pipe and treat it and send it over. But that's the situation where Chicago would have to treat its water to get it to lake standard, which would be more expensive. Um, that's a significantly heavier and more expensive lift than simply um, closing the lock, which would mostly just implicate shipping. So Eric asks, uh, can you explain the red and blue icons on the map that you that we just showed? So the so the map, I think it was the. I can see the edge of the slide. All right, hang on. Yeah. Let me uh, let me pull it back up. I'm sorry if it was cut off. Oh, um, yeah, I yeah, see. Yeah. So that is um, volume of cargo shipped through the seaway, and the uh, orange or red side shows the volume that's received at that port. And the blue um, shows the relative volume uh, that is shipped from that point. And it looks like you're talk we're talking about um, like the smallest circles are like 10,000 tons. The largest circle we're talking about 10 million tons. Um, that was like, that's a little, you know, that maybe does give you a sense of like what, you know, how much product is moving. But um, more importantly, I just really wanted to show that map to show the interconnection of the waterways. You know, one other thing, though, that, that that does remind me, and it gets back to the first question, is that the overall amount of product that's shipped on particularly the Illinois side. Now, I'll, I'll set the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway aside, but the part of the amount of shipping that um, would be impacted by, let's say, closing the Brandon Road Lock and Dam is very minor. It is a fraction of a fraction compared to what's moved on the inland waterway system. Most of the product is actually moved in the lower Mississippi. And so, um, and as, as things are changing, you know, the couple coal plants shut down in Chicago because we're moving away from coal, um, volumes have been dropping. And so, um, shipping has been in a precipitous decline really since the nineties. And so 
they continue to have um, kind of a lock on um, policy, but the economics of it kind of continue to be in decline. So just one more, you know, piece of data to, to kind of understand the, the shipping component on the inland waterway system. Okay, well, uh, I don't see any additional questions in chat, but I would say if you do have further questions, feel free to, to reach out to, to Robert. Um, uh, you know, by email, I, I think is probably the best way. I don't know, Robert, do you want to throw your email address in chat here for folks? Yes. Oh, wait, we do have another question here. So what do we do with this information? Who can we lobby? Oh, that's a great question. I'm loving that question. It is a good question. <laughs> you is know, there an answer? That's the, that's the real question. What are the chances of getting change? Um, so, you know, I, I think a similar answer to, to both of those. Um, I think, well, to be self-serving, you know, Pravers Network, and there are other groups too, you know, Sierra Club, um, American Rivers. Um, I do think it's important to support groups who have river interests and river focus. Um, but we, <laughs> we need to move away from polluting industries. You know, so much of the, what I'm talking about is like, we are giving them a pass. And so, um, all I can say is engage with organizations that put pressure on Congress or on elected officials, on decision makers, on agencies to force polluting industries to internalize their costs. Um, you know, like we, we say that we're a market oriented country. We say that we're a capitalist country. Sometimes, <laughs> you know, I think, um, I, you know, I, I don't have, I don't have the you know, something that I've learned in all this work is that, you know, there's no one right way to do any of this. You know, I think there's no magic key. There's no magic spell. I think if we, if we knew the, the answer, we would, we would do that. And I think it's bit by bit moving this forward. And so, um, you know, thinking about invasive species, thinking about land use, thinking about what's going into our water, all of that's important. You know, I think it, because I, I think as we do think about this system, if we can make progress on one piece, it's going to pay dividends somewhere else. You know, I, I really believe that. So um, that's my, you know, that is my answer is to get involved, be involved, participate. Um, you know, we often will ask um, our members and the public to speak up and send their voice and send an email, call an elected official. And it's important, you know, the uh, elected officials hear from the fossil fuel industry. They hear from ag. Um, you know, we're considering the ethanol mandate right now. And they hear from farmers. <laughs> um, do they hear from people whose water is polluted by farming? Not always. So we've got to um, we've got to do better. Do they have? Does MWD have their water up to lake or near lake standards? Um, MWD has extreme like, and you know, again, I, I presented a slightly one sided version, but MWRD has made significant strides. Uh, oftentimes at the um, <laughs> due to lawsuits that have been filed <laughs> on behalf of, on part of our organization and others. But um, so I don't want to say that um, pro progress has not been made. You know, the Chicago River is much cleaner than it was when they were literally throwing hog carcasses into it, um, which is why it's called Bubbly Creek. Um, so yeah, progress has been made, but um, it's not quite up to lake standards and it would be significantly more expensive to get it up there. There's also the flood component. You're right, Tom. Um, that's a whole other issue that I didn't totally get into, but um, Chicago also uses the river as a means of, of flood water conveyance. And so that would have to be addressed as well. Um, of course, how we've degraded and managed the rivers um, often <laughs> uh, exacerbates flooding. So um, there's that as well. There were a couple of other questions. Um, a nice softball question of how did you get involved in river work? I think this is this is a good question. Just to get to know get to know more about you and, and how you uh, uh, 
got involved? Well, I, I got involved with it by joining Prairie Rivers Network. So I, I came out of law school and I kind of focused on environmental law with um, a great environmental thinker, Eric Freifogel at University of Illinois Law School. And he was a board member of Prairie Rivers Network at the time. And um, he influenced me a lot and kind of set me on the path that I'm on and kind of got me pointed in this direction. Um, I highly recommend his books, Eric Freifogel. Um, he talks about um, property and land use and environmentalism in a different way than, than I generally hear people talk about it. Why is no one talking about the invasive species that can come down the river? Well, you know, that's a good question. Again, part of what I was kind of getting at was just that, you know, I think we've let the rivers become so degraded that we have really lost the constituency to rally around them and demand action. Um, I, I do, I credit the Great Lakes groups for, for taking action to stop invasive carp and for letting decision makers hear about invasive carp at every turn. Like that's a great credit to them. We need to do that for the for the rivers. We need to be better organized, you know. And, and there is some push. Um, there's push to do that, you know. There's um, there's a lot of money that flows into the Great Lakes through the Great Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Hundreds of millions of dollars a year that goes to um, ecological restoration around the lakes. And there's a push to do a kind of similar thing for Mississippi River states. Um, and I think you know that's the kind of thing that um, builds that constituency. So, you know, I, I, that's, I think it's going to take some time, but we really have to build constituencies for rivers if we want to protect them from invasive species coming this way. Many indigenous people are water protectors find and support their work. Uh, couldn't agree more. You know, I don't know that there's anything else to say about that. You know, I think, um, that's a hundred percent correct. Yeah. Ukraine is accelerating transition to a cleaner economy. There's some truth to that. And there's some, you know, it's interesting how some of that's playing out both in terms of how do we, you know, are we going to be relying on fossil fuels forever? Um, and also what are we, what are we growing on our land? You know, like there's a food crisis that's going to come out of the Ukraine situation. And right now we're growing um, fuel <laughs> and not even very good fuel on 20 million acres of prime farmland in this country. Um, we, could, we should be using it to grow food. Uh, why can't river traffic barges be loaded, unloaded downstream of Barden? Brandon, sorry. Um, yeah, so like setting up some kind of multimodal facility is definitely possible. Um, whether you would get moved to rail or, or, or truck or something else. Um, uh, Chicago itself does not appear to have a large volume port. Yeah, again, the volumes of, mo of, of, of commodity movement through the cause is not really that high relative to other areas of the waterways. Um, will the change to organic crop on a very large scale save the soil? Um, change the runoff. So, um, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say that just going organic is going to save the soil. I think that's got to be bigger than that. I think there's are other things that are needed. Um, we need to be diversity on, on the landscape, um, uh, not growing just two crops. Um, we need to not channelize our rivers. We need to let rivers interplay with the floodplain. Those floodplains should be wetlands. They should not be cropped. We're paying for farmers to, 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 to put crops in those areas. And then when they flood, we're paying them <laughs> insurance. We're paying the cost of what got flooded out. We should be using that to filter uh, nutrients that are running off ag lands. We should not be farming. Um, there should be buffers between farms, fields, and, and, and waterways generally. Um, we need to do, uh, we need better rules on how fertilizer is applied. You know, we're spraying hog manure from, you know, 10,000 head uh, factory farm CAFO facilities on frozen land. And then what do you expect? It's going to run off. And so there's just not enough rules on, on a lot of this stuff. So um, doing all of those things, having cover crops, having continuous year round uh, coverage on the land could help. Um, with some of those runoff. Uh, I don't think it's just about organic, but that, that would help. In the big picture, we want to break eco ecosystems into separated systems. Just not sure how to deal with overwhelming waves of invasives. Yeah, Leslie, it's a great point. I don't know that we want to break them into separated ecosystems. Um, and the reality is we've got 
you know, 7 billion people on the planet and, and we're moving all over the place and we're carrying things with us. Um, you know, I'm not particularly optimistic about stopping invasive species from moving as long as we're doing that. Um, you know, and so, but it's kind of like how, you know, I, I think we're, we're breaking them up either way. Are we, are we, are we electrifying the rivers in order to stop invasive species from moving? You know, are we, are we building, which way are we building barriers? And so um, I think we're kind of breaking it up piecemeal one way or the other, but the question is um, to whose benefit? <laughs> so um, yeah, it's a, it's a, I think the invasive species question is, is very difficult because as long as um, humans are moving all about the planet um, on, on through all modes of transportation, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know how we're going to address that.